Greetings and welcome to yet another lectionary podcast here from Concordia Theological Seminary in scenic Fort Wayne, Indiana. And we have a joy today as we encounter Isaiah 50. Yes, it's late summer, early fall, depending where you are, Alaska, Hawaii, or throughout the world. But in this time, as far removed from Holy Week as possible, we get Isaiah 50, verses 4 through 10, which Kula, one of the major commentators on Isaiah, describes as the Gethsemane of the servant. That said, happy Monday, Thursday in fall, late, or in fall slash summer. Uh, context is everything, and that's frankly one of the challenges that we really do have as we encounter these lectionary texts. You haven't dealt with Isaiah for a while. Frankly, you probably haven't dealt with a servant song for a while in the way that they come up in the pericope cycle. Uh, that said, Isaiah 50 is one of the major servant songs in this part of Isaiah. And it's part of an unfolding pattern that goes way back to Isaiah 42 and also Isaiah 49. So let's take a quick look, again, looking at this from about 30,000 feet above sea level, just to find out what's been going on. So Isaiah 42 is actually where the servant has been introduced in Isaiah. Uh, the servant starts out in pretty positive terms in Isaiah 42, a spirit-filled leader who now is doing the role that the Davidic Messiah had been doing way back in Isaiah, uh, basically 3 through 12. All those attributes of the Davidic king and now are being transferred to the servant. But the problem in 42, especially by verses 18 to 25, is that this great servant figure that we're all excited about is blind and deaf, unable to hear. A pattern in Isaiah that exists throughout is that all of the human attempts to do things fail miserably. 42 points us to an idealized servant, Israel, that no longer can be done. So instead, we move on to Israel reduced to one replaced by the great Israel, uh, Jesus. This now moves on to Isaiah 49, 1-7, to where the servant speaks for the first time. A couple of things that happen here that really do shade how we should be reading Isaiah 50 is that one, the word is the only power of the servant. Two, he has a universal scope that goes beyond national Israel here. And that this mission expands even to the far coastlands. That said, the servant once again picks up here. And already we've had intimations of suffering and resistance happening. Frankly, 50 is really just setting us up for 53, the great Good Friday text. And in 54 through 7 in particular, the servant now speaks. And the servant now portrays himself as the perfect Israel, doing what Israel cannot do in order to save Israel. If, I were to, if you were to ask me on the street, and feel free to do if you ever come to scenic Fort Wayne, how would I describe sin in Isaiah? A couple things come to mind. One, blindness, deafness, hardness. And this idea of ignorance needing to be transformed is an essence of how Isaiah visualizes salvation. That said, now let's take a look at the text, which actually starts out with the teaching word. Here in Isaiah 50, verse 4. Arai Yahweh, Netain Li. Yahweh has given to me a tongue of a Lamudim. Cal passive participle from Lamad. Shurek tells you it's a, it's a Cal passive participle bad handwriting, regardless, a tongue of a disciple, of a taught one. This contrasts and looks back all the way back to Isaiah 30, for example, in which a promise is made that the people will be ones who are taught. So how is this servant able to function? Because he is taught by Yahweh. And what does he know how to do? Lada'ath ha'avath, to know how to sustain or to help uh, that's from, uh, that's a kel from Avath, uh, infinitive construct with the Lamed constructed to it. 
knowing to help the weary. Debar, with a word. God's word brings about change. And the word that the servant, Jesus, brings, brings about the change. And even more so, we see God's radical action in the servant. I uh, note the repetition of Yair. Yair boker baboker. Baboker twice. Nice little in inclusio here. He wakens in the morning, in the morning, he wakens to me an ear. To hear like a disciple. So the first way that the servant is described is one who is taught. One who, can, who is in complete accordance with, God, with the divine will. Pretty important in the sense of also what does it mean for him to be taught? Suffering looms here. And for him to be taught means he's going to accept the suffering that is necessary for the sake of the people. Now we move on to verse 5. Adonai Yahweh, pahat li, ozen. The Lord Yahweh, note the repetition here, strong emphasis upon, upon God's decisive action. And the Lord Yahweh has opened to me an ear, ba'anoki lo uh, marati, mara, for those of you who recall Exodus. This is loaded Exodus language here. Marah, the language for rebellion. And how have the people been described throughout? They've been described as people who are marah. Another word for them, they've been sarar, stubborn, rebellious. And now this servant does what they can't do. He does not rebel. And backward, and... And Baharon... Lo nasugati, and backwards I do not sug, I do not, I do not turn away. And that's a nifal. The nun tells you it's a nifal. The radical aback, the radical obedience of the servant is on display here, and this is now where we really do get that Gethsemane language. And now the suffering really. And this is honestly setting us up more for Isaiah 53 as well. Here in verse 6. Uh, Givi, uh, my back, uh, Natati, I gave to the, to the strikers. This is always a fun word. That's a hypho infinitive construct. From Naka to the strikers. And my cheeks... Here's a word that if you, you know, no matter how good your Hebrew vocab is, you probably didn't know. At least I had to look it up again. Uh, marat. To the pluckers, literally. And now this image is utter shame. The servant lies exposed and disgraced. Uh, plucking out a beard for those of us who shave on a regular basis isn't all that exciting. But the image here is utter disgrace and humiliation. Something to keep in mind whenever we see this language of embarrassment and shame uh, that we probably in most of our context don't quite get how bad this is. Uh, shame, and we'll see this language later, is worse than death. He is utterly excluded because he is the obedient one. My fa And my face... Pene lo, his, his tarti, my face I did not hide. Hifil from sitar, I did not hide. And now here's the language of shame. From shame. And, and uh, baroque, another word that we don't normally see too often. And spitting. He is willing to accomplish God's purposes for humanity to take on absolute shame for the sake of salvation. And the reason why, now we move on to verse 7. Ba'adonai Yahweh, note, we saw this already, and the Lord Yahweh, what? Ya'atzar li, he will help me. 
Therefore, all Cain, I will not be disgraced. Again, no, shame language is big here. That he's no longer going to be ashamed because he counts on Yahweh to help him. All Cain, therefore, and now, and now we have hard-headedness at its finest, at its finest. Shemati pane ki halamish. I have set my face like flint. Va edat ki lo ebush. And I know ki lo, I will not be ashamed. And that's just a regular old cow bush. I will not be ashamed. This statement of trust now continues. Karov masdi. Mastiki, me. Near is my vindicator. My vindicator is near. Now the questions start happening. Me, Yariv, uh, E.T., who will strive, contend, courtroom language? Who will contend with me? A cohortative of, uh, this is a cal cohortative of, of a mod. Cohortative, that tells you it's a cohortative. Let us, a mod, let us stand together. A uh, curious expression here, literally, me ba'al mishpatim, mishpati, uh, who is literally the Lord of my justice. Uh, this is an idiom, uh, contender, prosecutor. Who is my prosecutor? Uh, from the gash, let, us, let him draw near, take that, uh, take that as a jussive, let him draw near to me. Now we move on to the conclusion with Hain. Hain, attention-getting particle. Again, third time's the charm here. Behold Adonai Yahweh. Behold Yahweh will help me. Who is he that will? That patak here, um, for those of you who have had me in class, the patak under the performative is a reminder that it's a hifil, it's an indicator of a hifil imperfect. Who will? So that's from Rasha. Interior dot vel also tells you that's a hifil. Who will uh, con condemn me? Rasha, that's your evil word. Who will condemn me? Hain kulam ki beged yivla. Therefore, all of them, like a garment, will wear out. A moth will devour them. So where are we within this part of Isaiah. Namely, we've seen the servant, the voice of our Lord, describe himself as one confident that he will accomplish his mission and willing, and willing to endure. The 10 actually begins a different section within this, within this part of, within this, within this chapter. However, it's pretty cool that it actually shows up. Uh, note, speaker changes. Me became uh, Yerah Yahweh. Who among you fears Yahweh? This is not the servant talking to you, probably the prophet here. Uh, speaker changes in Isaiah. Frankly, when you deal with Isaiah enough, you become so numb to him after a while. Who among you fears Yahweh? Uh, who listens? Shomea. Holm tells you it's a participle. Who listens to the voice of his servant? Asher Halak, uh, Hashakim, who walks in darkness and there is no light uh, for him, possessive Lamed. And namely, he will trust Yiftak Bashem Yahweh. Let him, or perhaps he, let him, he, will, he will trust in the name of Yahweh. And will rest on resting securely. Salvation Isaiah is a lot about not doing, rather trusting and trusting in his God. So where do we go with this text together? There's a lot of options for us to consider here. Perhaps playing around with the language of Flint is one direction I would go. After all, we're still in the endless green Sundays that are almost drawing to a close at this point. But this idea of 
how do we understand Jesus the servant's mission? And we have the voice of the servant here saying, one, he does what, he needs, what needs to be done. Two, he embraces suffering. And he's so wonderfully hard-headed that nothing will deter our Lord from saving us. And that elicits a response, and that's what we saw in verse 10. What does it mean to be a fearer of Yahweh? What does it mean, you know, fear of Yahweh, what does it mean to have faith? Namely, it means to listen to the voice of our Lord and to walk in his paths. We have a hard-headed Savior, a Savior who pursues us, a Savior who undeterred goes to the cross for us, a Savior that we respond to with faith, that we respond with this wonderful language of listening to the voice of his servant. May God give you a listening ears as you listen to this text, as you explore these wonderful possibilities here in the midst of servant song number three within the book of Isaiah. May God bless your preaching task.